there were something like 70 to 100 policemen um, on the road that night. There were some in the trees and sniper positions and some on the road. And seven men were killed. Several of the men were killed with single shots from the snipers to the head or the heart. And my father and one other man were shot several times, but the shots that killed them were fired at close range. All the men afterwards were left to bleed to death on the roads for about an hour. When they were moved, they were all taken to different locations, but none of them to emergency hospitals, almost to, to ensure that they died. And we at the time were inside the house, so we heard everything, we heard the shooting, but we were stopped from the poli by the police from leaving the house. Why was he killed? He was a very, very vocal politician. He was a very strong voice against the government. And he wasn't just any voice, he was the prime minister's brother. Not just the prime minister's brother, but he was somebody who people associated with the Bhutto family. And if you weren't going to have Benazir, maybe you might have him. So he was a threat, I guess, for his ideas, for what he was saying, and also maybe for what he represented to the people in power, to the fact that he was very critical of the army, for example. He didn't do business with the army. And when you don't do business with the army, it puts you against them. You write that Benazir Bhutto, your father's sister, and her husband, the actual president of Pakistan, Zardari, have a moral responsibility on the crime. Why? At the time that my father was killed, Prime Minister had empowered Benazir, that is, had empowered her police forces under this operation called Operation Cleanup, which sounds as awful as it was, really which was to clean up the city of Karachi. And in the year and a half period that Operation Cleanup was in effect, some 3,000 men were murdered in the city of Karachi in exactly this way. And we called them encounter killings, uh, which was that the police would turn up, they would say they were coming to arrest somebody. Of course, everybody at that time was a criminal or a terrorist. Or, and that person would be killed usually, you know, shot many times to the back. I mean, it was very clear that it wasn't a crossfire or an incident. And the police would say, oh, well, we tried to arrest them, but there was a problem. But really, they were extrajudicial murders. So at the time that this was happening, the city was uh, on fire. You know, this was how every day you woke up and the newspaper would tell you 12 people were killed yesterday in encounter killings. The police killed seven men last week. And most magazines would run Uh, tallies, like body counts. And the Prime Minister, in allowing this, had subverted the rule of law. I mean, if somebody is guilty, you arrest them, you take them to court. There were no courts at this time, it was just the police. And not only did she allow this, but she congratulated, she protected and she supported these police officers. And she's on record as saying they were doing the right thing. So she created an atmosphere of almost orgiastic violence. You know, there was, there was no uh, safety against it. In the Western world, Benazir Bhutto is a synonymous of democracy. Why do you think? Well, she was the first woman of a Muslim country to be elected as a head of state. And she was a very, um, a good picture. I mean, it, you know, it was very impressive. A young woman, an educated woman, um, a woman who spoke English, who was like them. But if you look at actually her record on the ground, Benazir was thought of as a Democrat, but she had declared herself the chairperson for life of her own political party, the Pakistan People's Party, um, which is something like you get in North Korea. Her government made no laws. They passed no legislation in the country. They didn't remove any legislation. They didn't do anything. She was a two-time woman prime minister who didn't remove the Hudud laws. The laws say if you commit adultery, you can be stoned to death. And if you engage in premarital sex, you can also be put to death. So basically what the laws say is that they criminalize the victims of rape. So if you're a woman in Pakistan and you've been raped and you're married, you just did adultery. And if you're single, 
you had premarital sex. And Benazir two times didn't remove this. And she didn't even try. So she didn't really strengthen democracy um, in Pakistan at all. I think it's, it's a Western image of her. Are those laws against women still uh, actual in Pakistan? The Hudud laws have still been in place. They've never been removed. People say in Pakistan, oh, you know, the Taliban is coming and the Taliban, oh, they do awful things to women. But we have federal laws. We have federal laws that are ap applied across the country for the last 30 years that do exactly that. What's the difference? Is it true that you refuse to be interviewed by the Pakistani press on your book? No, um, I was never asked by the Pakistani press. So the book came out one year ago in Pakistan. I launched it in Karachi. I've spoken all over the world. I've never been asked to talk in Pakistan. We have a culture of silence, you know. When this government falls, maybe then people will want to talk about them. But while they're in power, it's not done. Do you expect your book will change something in Pakistan? Part of the problem is, is that the book is available in English, in Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, that's it, but not in Urdu. People who read English are just thousands, but people who read Urdu are millions. Four members of your family has been killed in the last decades. Are you scared? Um, yeah, well, you know, if it was just the family, one might say, oh, well, it's because of the family or it's because of the politics or it's because of what happened. But it's not just the family. I mean, this is a country where every day people are killed. Whether they're students or they're lawyers or they're journalists or they're politicians. There's a history of political assassinations and then there's a history of assassinations. I mean, that makes me scared that it's everywhere and it's anyone. How do you live in Karachi? Are you free to hang around or you're under protection? Uh, well, it changes. At the moment, it's not very free. At the moment, I have very restricted movements. Clearly, this is a government that exists only on the blood of my family. It's a government that exists because it has hijacked, really, a name. And when you actually have that name and you say that this is wrong or you say, you know, um, what the government is doing is expedient or it's unjust, it makes it a problem. I not only speak about the corruption of the government, but the current president, until he became president, was accused in my father's murder case. He was standing trial. I probably would like people not to remember this kind of stuff. Are you religious? No. Um, I was always secular. There are many Pakistanis who think that religion is a totally private matter and it doesn't have a place in public life. So I guess you don't believe in an Islamic state? I don't believe in any religious state, really. I mean, Pakistan is an Islamic state in name, but when it was founded, you know, the, the founder of Pakistan said that this is the state that was founded for Muslims, but it's also a state that has its doors open for Hindus and for Christians and for Sikhs and for Jains. And it's not only Muslims that will have the freedom to go to their mosques in our new country, but also all these other religions. And this is a speech, by the way, that nobody talks about anymore. I mean, you, you, we know it because we can go online, we can read books, but they don't talk about this. Does internet change uh, the situation of the people in your country? In some ways, the stuff that the Pakistani papers don't print, we can find online. But the problem also is that we have a country that's largely illiterate. So you have, officially I think the literacy rate is around 40%, but the only qualification for literacy is the ability to write your name. So if I can write Fatima, it means I'm literate. And access to computers is difficult. Um, if people had more access to computers, you know, it happens now, you see it around Africa, there's a new kind of literacy a literacy that works with SMS and works with email. That's not like reading books, but it teaches people at least a mode of communication. That hasn't really happened in Pakistan yet, but hopefully it's something that will happen because the, the need is really great. And in most small towns you go to, there is a cyber cafe. Maybe people only play games <laughs> on the computers, but it's something. Do you believe in socialism or in a free market? 
you know, in, especially in a place like Pakistan where you know that the wealth of the country, whether it's the land or the industry or the resources, is owned by five people. Socialism becomes a very attractive philosophy. Ideally, maybe you have a mix, you have a mixed economy. At the moment, though, in Pakistan, you probably need more of, of socialist restructuring. Actually, Pakistan is an ally of the United States, but at the same time, it hosts many terroristic organizations. What game is your country playing? <laughs> I mean, what game is any country playing? I don't think there's any country that doesn't have its hands dirty. But I think Pakistan is in a position where you have a state and an establishment that survives on foreign money, on billions and billions and billions of dollars of American aid. But they also have a country and a population that thinks that's wrong. But it goes back 20 years, I think, this issue. It goes back to the 1980s and the American involvement. When, you, when America gave the Pakistani military and the Pakistani intelligence billions of dollars of aid and guns and weapons and machinery to help the Mujahideen fight the communists in Afghanistan. That's not a tie that was ever broken. And you can't expect it to break. You can't build a monster and then be surprised when it still lives. Is Pakistani really helped by the Western money? If we look at just the last three years of Obama, it's something like a proposed $7 billion, $7.5 billion in development uh, aid. Uh, which, of course, we know goes nowhere because this is a country where there's no electricity, there's no roads, there's no schools, so where is the money going? The, the billions in military aid keep going. And what this money does is it keeps unpopular, illegitimate, corrupt, violent governments in place. Because how can you fight a government in an election, let's say, when we have an election? How do you fight a party that has as, at, at its resources billions of dollars. You can't. You know, it impedes the democratic process. It makes sure that these people are unremovable, are untouchable. Do you have any hopes from the Obama administration? When Obama expanded the Afghan war, it meant that Pakistan was going to be in trouble. The first drone attack Obama did against Pakistan was one day after he took office. And his policy has been the same. He supports the same corrupt governments. So no, I don't really have any hopes for the Obama administration, and certainly not for his Secretary of State. Is there a new way of doing politics today in the world? I hope so. I mean, I, I hope that we know now that transparency is one of the most important factors in a democracy, and I hope that things like WikiLeaks which maybe don't tell us new information, but they tell us what we suspected. And they expose government secrets from their own people. You know, these protests happening in the Middle East, um, I hope it, it, it reminds people at least that you can have oppressive governments and maybe you can have them for 30 years, but at some point you can't have them anymore. Because people remember and people's memories are long. But I don't know if it's yet a new way of doing politics. I think it's a new experiment and we have to see if it works. Will you follow your family tradition and become a politician yourself? No. Uh, no, because I do, I genuinely think that for Pakistan now it's, it's going to be 64 years old this year. And it has to make a choice very urgently whether it wants dynasty or democracy. And we had 30 years of dynasty. And we know that dynasty didn't um, strengthen democratic institutions. It didn't push for progress or radical reform. Um, it didn't make the country safer for anyone, for women or minorities. Or, um, it, it's a kind of mafia, really. It only protects those, well, and very loosely it protects those inside it. And, and democracy is the opposite. Technically, I mean, it's the inclusion of many different people and many different thoughts and, and a creative way of dealing with, with conflict or, or with, with difference. And if Pakistan chooses dynasty, I think we're in big trouble. Um, if we choose democracy and we're able to give more voices to the politics of the country, then I think the hope for Pakistan is enormous. 
because it is a hopeful country. It's a country that should be strong. It should be powerful because it has resources. It has oil, it has gas, it has land to grow food. It has a huge population, um, especially a young population. But that only becomes just or it only becomes strong in a system that's free and dynasty is not free.